macOS is, in general, a really good operating system, but it's not perfect. So in this video, I've pulled together 10 of the most common complaints that I hear from Mac users, along with how to fix them. Okay, let's get into it. Here's how to fix three common complaints with the traffic light buttons in the top left of your apps. You probably already know that the red button closes the current window, the yellow button minimizes the window, and the green button puts the app into full screen and hides the menu bar. They all work exactly as designed, but all three of them tend to frustrate people for different reasons. Let's start with the green button. When you click it, the app jumps into full screen, moves you to a separate desktop space, and hides the menu bar and clock. For a lot of people, that's annoying. In most cases, you just want the window to fill the screen while keeping the menu bar visible. To fix this, go into System Settings, choose Desktop and Dock, and look for Window Title Bar Double Click Action. Make sure this is set to Fill. Now, instead of clicking the green button, just double click anywhere in the title bar at the top of a window. That will maximize the window to the full size of your display while keeping the menu bar in place. Next up is the yellow button. A common frustration here shows up if you use Command and Tab to switch between apps. When you minimize an app using the yellow button, it still appears in the app switcher, but selecting it doesn't bring it back. You then have to go down to the dock and click the icon instead. An easier way to handle this is to avoid minimizing altogether and use Command and H instead. This hides the app rather than minimizing it. It achieves the same result visually, but now when you use Command and Tab and select that app, it immediately reappears. Finally, the red button. This one often catches out people who've moved over from Windows. Clicking the red button doesn't quit the app. It only closes the current window and leaves the app running. If you actually want to close the app completely, click the app name in the menu bar and choose quit, or just use the keyboard shortcut Command and Q. That fully closes the app rather than leaving it running in the background. Oh, just quickly, if you also own an iPhone, you might be interested in the daily swipe. It's an email that I send out every single day containing a quick tip for the iPhone. It takes seconds to read and implement, and better yet, it's absolutely free. If you want to check it out, scan the QR code that you can see on screen or click the link in the description. The trackpads on MacBooks are, in my opinion, the best in the business. But if you're used to a mouse, moving files and windows around with a trackpad can still feel a bit awkward, especially if you're using a large external display. It just isn't as effortless as it is with a mouse. There's a setting hidden away in accessibility that makes this much easier. Open system settings, choose accessibility from the sidebar, then scroll down to the motor section and tap pointer control. As long as your Mac has a trackpad, you'll see an option called trackpad options. Click into that, turn on use trackpad for dragging, then in the dragging style dropdown, choose three finger drag and click OK. Now when you want to move a window, a file or an app, just place the pointer where you normally would and use three fingers on the trackpad to drag it around. It's far easier than the usual thumb and finger method, and once you get used to it, it's hard to go back. I'm sure you already know how to take a screenshot on your Mac, but just in case you don't, here's the easiest way to do it. Press Command, Shift, and 5 on your keyboard. That brings up a row of screenshot options along the bottom of the screen. The buttons on the left are for screenshots, the ones on the right are for video capture, and there are a few extra options alongside those. For this example, choose Capture Selected Window, then click on the window that you want to grab. You'll see a small preview appear in the bottom corner. If you open it, you'll notice that macOS adds a drop shadow around the window. It looks nice, but it isn't always what you want, and a lot of people don't realize that you can turn this off. To do that, follow the same steps again. Press Command, Shift, and 5. Make sure that Capture Selected Window is selected, but this time, before you click the window, press and hold the Option key on your keyboard. Then click to take the screenshot. When the preview appears and you open it, you'll see there's no drop shadow, just a clean screenshot of the window. There is a way to disable the shadow permanently using Terminal, but for most people, this is the quickest and easiest way to get exactly the kind of screenshot that you want. It's the holiday season, and we all know that means one thing, deadlines. And while everyone else seems to be already enjoying their Christmas break, you're stuck in the office trying to get your projects finished. And honestly, there is nothing worse than trying to get to the finish line with a Mac that feels like it's running in quicksand. It's bogged down by a year's worth of digital cookies, cache files, and system junk. And that's why I'm using Clean My Mac to get things in order. Big thanks to them for sponsoring this video. I like to think of Clean My Mac as like a double espresso for your Mac. When I'm using it on a slow machine, I just hit the Smart Care button and it clears out the junk that's slowing me down so I can actually meet those deadlines. I've been using the My Clutter feature 
to find gigabytes of old video projects and duplicate downloads that I'd completely forgotten about. The kind of stuff that you know you need to get rid of, but I'd never have found it on my own. And then there's the assistant. This is great because it spots apps that are draining my battery or using too much memory, so I can shut them down and keep the performance tight. It basically means I can get my work done faster, close the laptop, and actually enjoy the break. So, eat all the cookies you like this holiday season, just don't let your Mac hoard them. If you want to get tidy today, check out the link in the description to try Clean My Mac free for seven days. And if you decide to stick with it, which I think you will, you can use my code PROPERTECH for 20% off. Here are two image-related tips that I find myself sharing a lot. The first one is for when you've got images on your Mac that you want to email or upload somewhere, but the file size is too large. Your Mac has a built-in way to resize and convert images. Just right-click on the image, scroll down to Quick Actions, then choose Convert Image. From here, you can pick a format, JPEG, PNG, or HEIF. A quick tip on formats. In general, HEIF gives you the best balance of high image quality and smaller file sizes. I think a lot of people avoid it because it isn't quite as widely compatible as JPEG, but I'd always try HEIF first to see if you can get away with it. You usually get a much smaller file without sacrificing quality. Whichever format you choose, you can then tap image size and pick between actual size or large, medium, or small. Just keep in mind that once you start choosing large, medium, or small, the image quality can drop off fairly quickly. My usual approach is to start with HEIF and actual size, then switch to something like JPEG large if I need to. Once you've chosen your options, click convert and your image is ready. The second tip is sort of the opposite problem. I often hear from people who have an image in the Photos app on their iPhone or Mac and they want to share it, but it's saved as an HEIC file and the person they're sending it to can't open it. There's a really easy fix for this. Just drag the photo out of the Photos app and drop it into Finder. When you do that, you'll see the file appear as a JPEG. If you go back into Photos, right-click the same image and choose Get Info, it will still show as an HEIC file there, but the version in Finder is now a JPEG that is much easier to share. Smart folders are one of the most useful productivity tools on the Mac, but they're often misunderstood. People think they're far more complicated than they actually are. I'm gonna show you a really easy way to create one along with a genuinely practical example. So to create a smart folder, the simplest way is to start with a search. Open Finder, then click the magnifying glass in the top right corner. Let's say you regularly search for receipts. Type in receipt, then choose how you want the search to work. That might be name contains receipt or file contents contain receipt, depending on what makes sense for you. You'll then see a list of matching files from across your Mac. If you're happy with that search and it's something that you know you'll run often, click the save button in the top right of the finder window. A new window will appear asking you to name the smart folder and choose where it should live. I'll call this one receipts and for this example, I'll place it on the desktop. You can also choose to add it to the finder sidebar by leaving that box ticked which is completely optional. Then click save. If you now go to the desktop, you'll see a purple folder called receipts. When you open it, your Mac automatically runs that search again and shows you all the matching files. You can also keep this folder in the sidebar or even drag it into the dock if you want quick access. I've used receipts here as an example, but you can use this for anything. The key idea is simple. If there's a search that you run all the time, stop repeating it. Turn it into a smart folder instead and you'll have instant access to those results whenever you need them. This is a frustration that I hear from Mac owners all the time. The backspace key doesn't seem to delete. If you've come from a Windows PC, that's because you're used to having a dedicated delete key, which you don't get on a Mac. There are two simple solutions here. One applies to text, and the other applies to files and folders. So first, text editing. If you're typing and your cursor is at the end of a sentence, Pressing backspace deletes characters as you'd expect, but if your cursor is at the beginning of the text, backspace won't delete forwards, or at least it looks like it won't. If you press and hold the function key and then press backspace, it works like the delete key on a PC and removes text in front of the cursor. For files and folders in Finder, it works a bit differently. If you select a file and press backspace, nothing happens, but if you press and hold the command key and then press backspace, the file is sent straight to the trash just like deleting a file on Windows. If you're coming from a Windows PC, one thing that often feels strange on a Mac is that you can't cut and paste files in Finder. You can only copy them. That might not sound like a big issue, but it usually means you copy a file to a new folder 
and then you have to remember to go back and delete the original. There is a way around this, you just have to think about it slightly differently. On a Mac, you don't cut files, you copy them. So start by selecting the file and pressing Command and C to copy it to the clipboard. Then go to the folder where you want the file to live. Instead of pressing Command and V to paste, press Command Option V. This pastes the file into the new location and removes it from the original folder at the same time. In other words, it moves the file, which is exactly what you were trying to do with cut and paste in the first place. By default, a brand new Mac shows recently used apps in a separate section of the dock, just to the left of the bin. So if you've ever looked at your dock and wondered why apps you've never added are suddenly appearing over there, that's why. Some people like this and find it useful, but in my experience, most don't. They either want an app in the dock or they don't. If that sounds like you, there is a really easy way to turn this off. Go into system settings, choose desktop and dock from the sidebar and look for the option called show suggested and recent apps in dock. Switch this off. From that point on, the only thing that you'll see to the right of the divider is the bin and everything to the left will be apps that you've chosen to keep there yourself. Your Mac keyboard has a bunch of shortcuts built in for commonly used symbols. For example, here in the UK, shift and three gives you the pound sign, shift and four gives you a dollar sign and option and two gives you a euro symbol. The problem is remembering them and that's before you factor in different keyboard layouts in different countries or symbols that aren't mapped at all. There is a really easy workaround for this. When you're typing, press Control, Command, and the space bar. That brings up the emoji menu. You can scroll through emoji if you want, but down at the bottom, you'll see a small arrow pointing to the right. Click that, then click the menu button in the bottom right to open the full character viewer. From here, you can browse loads of different categories down the left-hand side. Things like arrows, bullets and stars, currency symbols, math symbols, brackets, and more. You can also just use the search box in the top right if you know what you're looking for. When you find the symbol that you want, just drag it straight into your text. Have you ever noticed that on your Mac, the F keys along the top don't actually behave like traditional F keys by default? Instead, they perform the extra functions that Apple assigns to them. So F1 and F2 control brightness, F5 starts dictation, F10 mutes your audio, and so on. If you actually want those keys to behave as proper F keys instead, there is an easy fix tucked away in settings. Open system settings, Choose keyboard from the left-hand side, then click keyboard shortcuts and select function keys. In here, you'll see a toggle that lets the F1, F2, and so on behave as standard function keys. If you ever want temporary access to the extra functions again, just press and hold the function key, which is the globe icon in the bottom left corner of the keyboard, and then tap the key that you want. So that was 10 common complaints for the Mac and how to fix them. What about you? Did you learn anything new? Or are there tips? that you think I should have included but didn't. Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.